too technical, talk about some general issues, what is scoliosis and what we do, and how do we fix it, really. So, um, so scoliosis essentially is a curvature of the spine, okay? And there is no clear evidence, but there's substantial evidence that it, a lot of it is genetic. And what grade are you guys here, mostly? Sophomores. Sophomores, okay. So you know what genetics is, so <laughs> I don't have to explain that part. So, so pretty much pre it's predetermined that you have a genetic marker that's going to cause you to have scoliosis. Now, we all carry it. Not all of us are going to end up having scoliosis, but a lot of us do. And it's fairly common. Uh, it's actually, you know, 0.1% of the population has it, which is not actually that small. If you think about it, there's, that's several million people. So said that, most scoliosis, we never have to do anything. Most of us don't even know that we have scoliosis. We go through life and someday maybe, you know, you're playing football or you're in a car accident, they shoot an x-ray and you have a small scoliosis. Those scoliosis are benign and really doesn't matter as much. But some curves over time can continue to progress and that may become an issue. And that's when, you know, they start showing deformity. And we try to call scoliosis deformity because it's like a deformity of your spine compared to an arm deformity or a skull deformity or a different kind of deformity kids are born with that you must be cleft lip being one of them. Um, any questions? Do you, do you, are, are we on the same page about your understanding most of the things? Because I don't want to make this too technical, okay? So, there, so the kind of scoliosis, there's many different kinds of scoliosis. Kids can be born with scoliosis. It's very rare, but it can happen. There are congenital malformations that take place. And in utero, they have changes that happens. Those are very complex problems. They can progress very rapidly, and that's, that's a much more difficult problem. Mo fortunately, or however you want to look at it, if you were to have it, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is a more benign condition. It's just a regular curvature of the spine that happens. It starts when you're kind of going through your growth spurt, and over time it gets a lot worse. Some of the curves can continue to progress despite doing a brace and things like that. Uh, you had a brace for a period of time, or you never, yeah. So Zach probably never got identified early enough to put him on a brace, but if he came early enough, we saw a small curve, we would put him on a brace. And there is evidence to suggest that that may help some. But it doesn't help everybody because part of it is genetics and it will continue to progress. So the patients, if say they got braced and they didn't get um, better, then uh, they get to a point when the curve is very prominent. They may not have any pain or discomfort, but it's like any deformity. You want to get it to as normal of a situation as you can and keep the, what we say is a balanced spine because they're not tilted to one side. We try to get them straight and upright as best as we can. And that involves a surgery because we have to physically and mechanically change the spine. And uh, that's where um, I, I have a lot of training in that. And um, I do both pediatric and adult problems. Adult problems are actually very common, you know. Um, when I was training, um, that seems a long time ago. Uh, I used to, these adult patients used to come in and we used to say, you know, we really cannot do anything about it because the technology and the science had not been that advanced. Nowadays we are fixing very complex adult problems and we are, because we are able to do it. Uh, because the science and the understanding has got better. And uh, so uh, this is Zach's x-ray. So what, what we do, so scoliosis in itself, what, what is exactly happening? It's a three-dimensional problem. Even though we have two-dimensional x-rays, it's actually the spine is sort of turning on itself, okay? So that causes the hump, rib hump, and other things that are very noticeable on young patients. And that becomes concerning for the parents and the patient himself. So this is, um, I don't know, can you guys see this or should we you know, lower the lights down? So this is Zach's x-ray. Zach has been very nice to share his personal medical information. <laughs> so we're looking at it. These are the different, so this is the rib cage and this is the left side of the spine, that's the right side, and this is how his spine is curving. And as you can see, if you look at it, there are these two spots, what we call the pedicle. They're kind of straight down, you're looking at owl's eye, looks straight down. But as you can see, the spine is kind of turning itself, and you cannot see the other owl's eye, and it's kind of turning on it, you know, it's kind of rotating on itself. And that causes your whole trunk to rotate and all your organs to rotate with it. And sometimes these curvatures can be very, very big. So when we see that, there are certain criteria we look for. You know, Zach went through MRI scan, bending x-rays and things. And we looked at him and, and asked him, how does he feel about having this? And he was concerned. He was having some pain and discomfort. 
and was not happy with the situation. And his mother, unfortunately, um, also has scoliosis, and she has experienced a lot of issues as she has got older through the years. And uh, so we kind of mutually talked about this and decided that we should go for a correction. Then you say, why didn't we brace Zach? Zach was of an age that he has gone through the majority of his growth spurt, and the brace is most effective when they're going through the growth spurt. So after a certain point, it's not as effective as it is. So Zach was in sort of that gray area, whether we leave it be and let it get a little bit worse and then treat it or treat it sooner, and then he can you know, get adjusted to his new almost a new body sort of situation and get on with his life, okay? And he chose to have the surgery. So any questions so far? You guys understand any, anything that you think is out of the ordinary? So I'll show you the uh, x-rays and I will kind of explain to you what we did and uh, so on. So we have to go back and forth. Let's show the x-ray. So this is what we did for Zach and these are, so what is happening, these are screws going into the bone. And we use the screw essentially to turn the spine and get it straight. And we make cuts on the bone and hold these rods to hold it together and then lay bone down of it. His back, essentially that's inside his back right now that he's standing right there and you don't see it. Uh, these are very strong. I have patients who had similar surgery in other places. They've been in car wrecks. They broke other part of the spine, but this one stayed intact. So this is actually stronger than the rest of his spine. So Zach's lower back is stronger than any of our backs in here. Because, you know, none of us have metal. Hopefully, anybody have metal screws and rods in place? So if you don't, then your back is not as strong as Zach's back. <laughs> so, uh, so these screws are going into the bone, and the rods are kind of holding the shape that we want the spine to be in, in place. Okay? Okay. Now, there, can we get the spine even straighter? Absolutely. But then the issues come in that there are nerves and the spinal cord is running over there. Okay? These are very sensitive structure. So there's a balance, you know, how much we can, in today's day and age, I have, we have technology that we can make every spine completely straight, but then we run into trouble with neurological issues, meaning their strength, their weakness, and things like that. So there's a compromise, you know what I mean? We can make it straighter, but is Zach going to wake up having some weakness in his legs? So we kind of play this balance card all along and get to a point where it is an acceptable correction and just accept that. And you know, the sur you don't want to make the surgery more than it needs to be. There, where Zach's spine is, there's no evidence he's going to have any more issues related to this. Can he have back problem when he gets older? Sure. 90% of the people in this room will have back problem when they are 90, you know, 50 years old. So back problem is a very common problem, but there's no good evidence that if you have scoliosis as a young kid, you have a higher chance of back problem. The percentages are exactly the same between two groups of people who are born with straight spine. So essentially, that's what we did. And uh, now, you know, if this is all healed and he can essentially do anything he wants to. I have patients who play NCAA softball. Um, there's a swimmer uh, in the Olympic team who has a scoliosis surgery. Uh, Anna Sorensen, I think, she's a LPGA golfer who has scoliosis surgery. So scoliosis is very common. There are major athletes in the world that have scoliosis surgery and they're performing at a high level. So there's a misconception that if you have scoliosis surgery, you, you can do. Probably, I would say what I restrict patients from is playing football maybe playing um, wrestling is another sport that is very tough to deal with because you know there's a lot of movement. Um, gymnastics might be a little difficult, but those are limited sports, you know, and there are a lot of other sports patients can play and uh, have a very productive life without any problems. So that's all about scoliosis. Any questions? Sure. So when you're like at the airport and you go through the metal detector, are you gonna go off? Yep. So, uh, well, technically you can go up, but if the question is, there are about 48 million people who have implants in this country. So out of 350 million people, 48 million people have some sort of metallic implant. They have pacemakers, hip, knees, and everything. So they all can go up. So these are common medical procedure. So when they go through the x-ray, they can see that they have screws and rods. So, it, you know, so that, uh, it used to be a bigger issue before. Nowadays, they essentially scan everybody that it's a non-issue almost. Go, uh, go, um, sorry, I, I could have said. Go ahead. Um, wouldn't screwing the rods into a spine disrupt the nerves, or do you have to have like, do you have to like specially length the screws, or do you have to like screw them in a certain Right. Way? Yeah. Uh, so that th that's the. You know, that's why I'm doing it and not done in every garages, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so that's the good thing about it. Uh, you, you just cannot get a toolkit and an instruction manual and start doing this. So um, you can, I guess, but then that's a different conversation altogether. No, actually, what happens, there are structures. Um, so do you mind if I draw this? That? So, so each vertebral body, so these are the bones. Okay? This is sort of the side view of this. So I'm going to kind of draw it out. So there is this structure that are connected. Okay, I'm kind of doing a crude drawing, so bear with me on this. So the nerves and the spinal cord are kind of running in between, and this is the bone. There's better. Yeah, this is kind of, I guess nobody uses this nowadays, but I understand. I'm like old school with this. Yeah. Yeah. So this is sort of yeah. So this is sort of the bone structures, you know, and there are joints over here. And the nerves and the spinal cord, to answer you, is running over here. So they're on the inside of it. And this is sort of the side profile, and that's the front profile. So these are these structures called pedicle. And this is the vertebral body. And the nerves are sort of running right here. OK? And the spinal cord is running over there. The spinal cord ends at here, what we call is L1, L2. There's no spinal cord all the way in the bottom. It stops right over here, OK? so. So when we put the screws, we put these screws through these bony channels, OK? And yes, there is risk that you know, the nerves are right next to it. But that's, that's what you train for. You know? Years after years, you, know, you go through cadavers and you know, looking at hundreds of books you know, and just train with somebody who has done thousands of this and spend time how to put, put it in, OK? And, uh, and so you get it in very well inside the spine. So what happens, now you have this bone, say if you were to take I don't know, take this as you know, the vertebral body, and you have these two prongs that are sitting in. So we have these devices where we kind of, and he hasn't heard this part, but so I don't want to scare him too much. This is what I was doing to his body. So we essentially take the spine and straighten it out, and, we, you know, and hold it in place and let the rod, which is shaped the way we want it to be shaped, you know what I mean, and put the spine right there, and then tighten the screws down. Yeah, it's, it, it is scary if you don't watch it for the one. So don't, how long did that take? Oh, how long did it take? For six hours or so? Yeah, it takes about six hours. Uh, so we make a lot of cuts in the bone to make the spine a little bit loose. We're not just forcing and jarring things. There are a lot of in-between steps that we are doing it. Yeah. So is each rod shaped differently for each basic? Ab absolutely, yeah. So but it, it is getting better and better, you know what I mean? We are learning, you know, spine, you know, as with medicine, you will know, if you're interested in it, this is a great thing about it. I do this surgery completely differently than how I was trained. Because we have learned in the la last 15 years that I've been practicing through my training and now, there has been evolution, you know what I mean? So what has happened, uh, how we do things that has evolved over time. So now we have a lot of parameters we use that we can, we tailor the rod, we bend the rod based on those parameters that we see. When I was in training, we kind of estimated a lot of it. Now it's becoming more and more specific. And I think you know, by the time I'm done working, you know, we will probably have you know, the 3D printing sort of thing. You just put in those parameters, and the rod kind of comes out in your hand, and you just kind of put it in kind of thing. So I think those, those sort of is the future of it. Yes? My question is, you said that we all have the capability of getting scoliosis genetically. Correct. So as a parent, I always tell my kids, stand straight and tall, you yeah. know? Is there anything that can be done to prevent it? Or, it, I mean, it just. Yeah, uh, one is no. So you have, if you have a genetic marker and if you have a penetration, you know what I mean? There's a concept in genetics called penetration, meaning the genes shows through and it, it exposes, you know, your body will respond to it. There's not a whole lot you can do about that, number one. But the, fortunately, it doesn't happen that often, OK? But what is interesting, what she said, I tell my kids to stand straight. Actually, there's tremendous scientific evidence to suggest that is the very best thing to do for our spine, to stand straight and sit up straight. You know what I mean? So, uh, so but I, I will go in favor of the students and say something. That you, you know, we go through school, we sit a lot. It's the most inhuman thing to do to humans, you know what I mean? Meaning our pelvis is not designed for sitting. You know, we, we should be all gorillas the amount of time we sit around. <laughs> but by evolution, we are bipedal animals. We should be walking. So a lot of the thoughts nowadays that we have that, you know, the incidence of back problems are going up in the world, even in third world nation, China, Brazil, India, you know, where the people are sitting for long periods of time. The incidence of back problems going up is because our pelvis is not designed 
to be sitting for all the time. So when they have surgery, I told Zach, sit in the back of the room, get up and move around. Because what happens is you fix the spine and then you're loading the same area that's you know, is most vulnerable. You know, it's still healing and going through the process, so you want to unload that spine. So there are a lot of thoughts about that, that why there's more problems with lower back and things like that. But it's not related to scoliosis, it's just with black back in general. So posture is fundamentally very important. And to go back to your question, how we calculate how the spine should look is based on your posture and balance and how your pelvis is, okay? I, I, I may be getting a little technical, so l just tell me to back off, you know what I mean? <laughs> because I, you know, I have the talk in my head that is very different than what the audience is. Yeah, sure. Do these ever have to be tightened, or is this... No, they're tightened as a, so. So let's kind of explain why we are doing what we're doing. This surgery was done 50 years ago. They didn't put any screws and rods. They just laid bone down. So, so if you imagine you're building a building, you know what I mean, and you're putting in all the reamers and things like that, and you put cement all around it. Eventually, the rods are going to get rusted and they're going to fall apart. It's the cement and everything along with the rods that keeps the building erect. It is the same concept here. So this is the screws and the rods straightens the spine and holds it in place and we lay bone down. It's the bone that grows into a natural unit with the screws and the rod that keeps the spine straight. So if you're right, if, if it, actually one of the signs that the healing is not 100% when we start to see the screws and rods loosening up, that tells us that the bone didn't heal 100%. Do you use a torque wrench? Absolutely. 80 pounds of torque to tighten it out. <laughs> Every cap. And there's a breaker. You know, if you tighten it, it breaks off the cap. So we know we torqued it. It depends on the system you're using. But a lot of system has just a torque, and we see it, how far it's going. Some have these torque-sensitive caps. Like, we torque it, and the cap breaks up, so we know we torqued it enough. So it depends on what you're using. Yes? Okay, so after the surgery, do the rods stay in your back for the rest of your life? Or? Rest of your life. There are reasons to take it out. Some people are sensitive to metallic rods. You know, they are usually thin people. You know what I mean? And the patients who have a higher tendency of allergies. You know what I mean? Very rare in my and or infection uh, that that can cause us to take the rod out. In my lifetime, I, you know, with training and all in. Young kids with scoliosis, I can say five or six times we took it out, and that's over 15, 20 years, you know. So we don't do that very frequently. Most of the time it's because of an infection. Does Zach have limited movement? In extreme scenarios, yes. You know, you know he will have limitation in movement, but if you look at his day-to-day, -day, as we were talking about, day-to-day -day life, he... Yeah, you will not notice any limitations. Because some of the misconceptions we have, so for example, bending. So 90 degrees, up till you go to 90 degrees, it's not your spine that is bending at all. It's your spine is bending, but it's not doing the bending. It's your hips that is doing the bending. So patients have a lot of range of motion, day-to-day -day life. I think, you know, if Zach were to go into wrestling, he will notice substantial limitation because, you know, they're going twisting and turning people and things like that. So it depends on what activity you're involved in. Day-to-day -day life activity, most scoliosis patients don't have any issues. Because there's a lot going on in the motion than just your spine. What would have happened if that had been left untreated? Oh, it could continue to progress. And the, uh, so what happens if a curve is very big? OK, let's address that. that would, so it will probably continue to progress over time. If it's really big. This wasn't considered big? This is actually not one of the bigger curves. <laughs> yeah, so I was showing him some other stuff I had on the computer. This is, this is actually one of the moderate size curves we treat. So much bigger size curves we treat. So if it continues to progress, the complication risks goes up for correction. And you have to be more aggressive with the correction. So sometimes the curves are so big, we essentially we stage the operation. We do it over two days. And we essentially break the spine apart and then put it back together. So there's a lot of, you know, we will go and essentially dislocate the spine and then put it together. So th that becomes a much more complex issue. It's actually a question for Zach. How tall did you come after? I think I grew two inches, something like that. Yeah. So uh, I have a funny story about a very young female I operated. Actually, I was showing her him the x-ray, came to see me. So she was very tall to begin with. She was like 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, 
and she had a boyfriend who was younger. They were in high school together, and I made her taller, and she was not happy. Her boyfriend now was like, <laughs> like was like six inches shorter, and I got her like boom. I like added three inches or four inches, so she was now like five, ten, or eleven or something. So and uh, very unhappy with me immediately. I just saw her. Of, uh, she was four years ago. She's in college now, and we were laughing about it. So it was kind of interesting. Yes. Is it possible to bend a rod? Absolutely. I mean, I bend these in with my, you know, we have equipment to bend it with, yeah. Is you it possible for Zach to bend the rod once it's Oh, no, body? no, 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 no. They're t see, um, so l think about it. It's, uh, you know, you guys played with Tinker Toys, Legos, and stuff like that. So if you put, you know, if you hook up a rod with multiple fixation point and hook it to it, you won't be able to bend that rod. But the rod, when you take it off the screws and the caps, you can bend that rod in itself quite a bit. So. These rods are fairly thick, you know, it's about 5.5 millimeters in diameter, and so they're cobalt chrome or stainless steel, depending on what you're using. Is it, time's up, or what was that? Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, so you guys have to stay here, then you don't have to leave, okay, good. Uh, so we take these rods and um, we kind of shape them. You know what I mean? You don't want them to be super strong because you want to have some give, so you want to, you know, make it as the spine looks. So what is interesting, to answer your question, we actually select what kind of rods we're going to use depending on the deformity. The reason being is, so if you take a very strong stainless steel rod and you take that and you bend that for three days, and we have done this actually, three days later, that stainless steel rod will crack. So the more stiffer the rod is, its threshold or elasticity is low, so it will snap easily. Okay? So you want some elasticity in the rod so it gives a little bit. So in a weird way, the rod that gives a little bit is a little bit stronger than a rod that is completely stiff because it will give to the motion rather than crack easily. Do, does that sort of make sense? Yeah. So that's, that's how we use that sort of concept. But then there's a give or take. And a curve which is very stiff, meaning it, you cannot turn it, you need a stronger rod. So we do a lot of tricks. We, do, we use a stronger rod to do the correction, then take that rod out and put a softer rod in. So we got the spine corrected. We got it where we want it to be, then exchange rods out. So we have little tricks we do to kind of get all of those properties in. Any, okay, sure, uh, sorry. What kind of metal or metals are used to make the rods? Uh, the, the, uh, before it was all stainless steel. Nowadays we use a uh, alloy called titanium alloy, and there's a newer kind of rod called cobalt chrome and titanium alloy. And these are based on the principles we just talked about. There's a lot of give. You know, we want some give, but not too much. We don't want the breakage point to be very high, so it doesn't snap easily. So, so we're coming up with newer alloys to put that in.